So yes, we were asked <clears throat> to participate in this to make it a garden that children could be comfortable in, that uh, the school could use for lessons, and that could be a place of biodiversity. Um, I'll go through this part really quickly. I bet that most of you already know why pollinator gardens are needed. And it's because we depend on pollinators and pollinators depend on us. 75% of our food crops are pollinated by insects like bees, ants, wasps, butterflies, beetles. Um, they're mostly insects that pollinate <clears throat> Uh, plants around here. And then 90% of wild plant species. So our ecosystems, which are important for our healthy clean water, air, things like that, soil, we depend on these pollinators for a lot. But there are threatened, two out of five of the invertebrate pollinator species are threatened with extinction. And that's habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change. Yes, Jack? We were going to see if we need to turn off all the lights if we get a better video. Oh, better. no? Can everybody see the screen well enough? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is a map showing where the bees are declining in the United States, and the yellow is where it's the lowest uh, amount of bees. So uh, Illinois, as you could tell, is, is in the yellow zone. So that's very disturbing. And so we need to ha have more habitat for the pollinators where we live, where we work, where we play, where we go to school. But unfortunately, especially with schoolyards, this is the kind of biodiversity you normally get. <laughs> Grass and maybe a few trees, if you're lucky. So where are the bees gonna, you know, this is a food desert, of course, for bees. Um, Many people think of honeybees when you think of pollinators, and yes, they do pollinate a lot of crops, uh, but they are also uh, non-native around here, and they compete with native species, and they spread diseases to native species. So they do have a negative impact. Uh, this is the ideal range for rusty patch bumblebees. Uh, one has been recorded in a neighboring yard in the past few years. We're hoping that they're using them, that the Rusty Patch is using the Johnsburg Garden. We really hope so, because it, it's endangered. And 17% of all U.S. butterflies are in trouble as well. This is a <clears throat> endangered butterfly in Illinois, the swamp metal mark. And of course, you know, the monarch butterflies will probably soon be on the endangered list. Their numbers have been going down precipitously. This is the chart of the amount of hectares that they are found overwintering in Mexico. And the first bar is from uh, winter of 94, 95. This is last winter. It's only 2.21 hectares that they've been spotted uh, in. So I'm going to play you a message from Andy Reinhardt, the science teacher here who helped us get this garden in. And uh, he couldn't be here today, but he left us this message. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody, my name is Andy Reinhardt. I'm a science teacher at Johnsburg Junior High and I'm so uh, thankful that you guys were able to make the trek here today to Johnsburg to check out our pollinator garden. This is the third iteration of the garden that we've had here at Johnsburg Junior High. Um, I've been trying to use this in my classroom for years and years. And really it started out in about 2007 when we got a grant from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, and another science teacher and I, we got some plant plugs and picked out a spot for the garden. And we picked right underneath these honeysuckle bushes, these Japanese honeysuckle. They were probably living there for a very long time, dropping seeds every year. And we ended up having a lot of problems with re-sprouts of uh, Japanese honeysuckle. And the garden did have some native plants, but to be honest with you, it had a lot of wheat, uh, a lot of non-native invasives as well. Um, so then flash forward a few more years, and we got a grant from the Bob Flower Propagation and Preservation Committee 
who was wonderful to work with and really consulted us and gave us a lot of great ideas for um, some plants that would work well in the location. Um, and that garden worked better, but we still had a lot of maintenance issues um, with the site. Uh, we would come out and weed a few times a year, uh, but still it seemed like some of the um, grasses and uh, bushes were kind of always coming back to haunt us. Um, so really, we were thankful to have Small Waters come out and work with um, um, the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation, as well as a few other organizations to um, kind of make the garden something special and make it actually work. And that process has been really effective. And now the garden is really used in our junior high curriculum as a showcase for learning, right? It's just a place where we can actually go and uh, witness biodiversity on our school campus. Whereas before we really couldn't, um, you know, just a lot of grass on the school campus. Um, to do something like this, there's a lot of stakeholders within the school that need to be consulted. Um, a lot of times with maintenance at a school, they look at it as grass is the easiest and anything that anyone else does is going to be a uh, thorn in their side. And luckily we've been um, blessed with having a maintenance department that has heard us out on our idea. And we just kind of said, look, this is our area. We will take care of it. Um, and that's kind of what we've done with the help of Small Waters is kind of take care of it. And now it's, you know, a, a, a uh, something in our school that's, that's really worthwhile. Um, and I think part of the reason why it's like that is because we do have, um, it looks good year round. Um, a lot of times with a native plant garden, it can really look uh, problematic at different times in the year. And uh, Judy and Jack have done a good job kind of selecting plants and stuff that really do look good um, for most of the year. Um, our school yard is not very, uh, biodiverse. Uh, most of it is just turf grass. So when we bring kids outside to look at, um, you know, what nature is like and what uh, ecosystems are like, there's really nowhere we can show them uh, besides a bunch of dandelions, um, maybe, I mean, in, in, the, in the turf. So really that's how we use it in our curriculum is we use it as a learning laboratory um, for instance, one of the things we do is we have our seventh graders come out for a biodiversity study where we do a simple transect of our schoolyard and we look at the different species that are there. And then we do a simple transect of our native plant garden and try to ID some of those species of plants. Um, we do the bio blitz in May, which is basically just, we go out there and we find things in the garden that are living so we can talk about food webs. Um, I will show you guys some of the pictures that my, uh, my students have taken. I'm going to skip over because he didn't have screen share on, so. Um, you <laughs> can see the bees. Yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah, he was thinking he was showing photos, but. We identify different foods and uh, habitats that different creatures need that we find there. Um, we have not found the rusty patch bumblebee, um, although we have looked. And, um, you know, it, it's also used in the springtime with Friends of the Fox. Uh, Friends of the Fox comes out and we do a, a river study there. And it's a great example of how uh, runoff can be uh, a huge problem in our rivers and how native plant gardens and native plants can really slow down runoff for the physical features of the stream. And then also our elementary school uses it as a place that they raise uh, butterflies and they release them there in our pollinator garden and um, learn about parts of a plant and stuff. Anyway, uh, it, it really is truly a resource uh, that we have here at Johnsburg Junior High, a place we can go to find native plants uh, and insects and animals. Um, and we're thankful for um, all the community work that has gone into making this garden a success. 
Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, any questions or comments up uh, to what we've been covering so far and what Andy was talking about? <coughs> oh, well, then let's get right into the nitty gritty of it. How to. Oh, sure. How long did it take for the card to become whole, stored as you do? How long did they start the process? You might have said, I missed it. How long? Yeah, from the day that they planted the garden. Uh huh. What is today? Oh, we started it in 2017. So the garden that we're going to see today is six years old. Yeah, and we'll we'll show later on how in one season it it looked I mean, it was usable. You know, it wasn't a you know spindly little garden right away. It it, it really was lush from the Pretty, uh, pretty much from the beginning. So here's the how-to part. And it really does take a village. Uh, Nancy Williamson here is from Friends of Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge, and she's the one who contacted Small Waters Education saying, hey, we know about this grant that Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation is giving for school pollinator gardens. And that grant was really great. They covered lots of things, uh, including a sign and all the plants and the design and installation and uh, site prep and curriculum and maintenance, the all important maintenance. So uh, lo uh, looking around for, yeah, Nancy? I was just gonna say, are those grants still available and are they available for places? That's what I thought. Unfortunately, the money has, uh, in that fund has run out. Okay. Yes, and uh, there are no other grants that I know of like that. that are that comprehensive at this time. Uh, one place that is a good place to look to, to, that collects information on all the different grants available for creating pollinator gardens, not just in schools, but other places, is Possibility Place Nursery. They have a whole page where they update grants as they find them. So that's that's a good resource. So yes, Nancy. Well, and Judy, the Wildflower Propagation and Preservation Committee does still give grants to schools. I don't know that they do to anywhere else, but I think theirs are small grants compared to. to yes, the but wildflower. You're right. In in this county, the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee is still giving outdoor classroom grants. It's up to 800 plants, I believe, and it's only for the plants, and they will help you consult and choose your plants, but they won't give money for anything else. So, um, but it's, it's great. And, and in fact, many of the schools we've worked with that get, get the Illinois Clean Energy Grant, they would use the WPPC grant as well to make up for the gap. So, yes, Scott. Uh, and the, the uh, Combat Green Communities Grant that would be a, a, a potentially a good one too. Uh, I know we've got some municipalities or townships represented here. Uh, uh, it's up to ten thousand dollars, but there is a matching component to it, uh, which you know can complicate things. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a strong focus on pollinator habitat, so mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a fairly easy grant to submit for and to and to get and to, and to comply with. Uh, so if you're looking at a project, I would suggest that he's considering that it's uh, run through open lands, but I, I think it's called the Green, uh, the Comed Green Communities uh, Grant. Comed Green Communities Grant. That's a really good resource. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, <clears throat> so Friends of Hackmatack, Nancy, were the ones that actually wrote the grant. So that took a lot of the work off of Small Water's shoulders. Our job was mainly to do the site assessment, come up with the plant list, do the design, help organize the planting and the maintenance. Um, and then we also got some help, or the school got help from McSeep, the McHenry County Schools Environmental Education Program, which helped them um, develop some curriculum. And that was paid for by the grant as well. Judy, before. So, yes. And one last thing, 
We brought in a contractor to remove some of the most egregious invasives professionally. And oh, yes. the maintenance staff here, like Andy said, just jumped in and helped with everything, including stripping the sod. And yeah, I'll, sh I'll show how that happened. It. Yeah, yeah. Right, so there was a, a lot of involvement. Um, and as Andy was saying in his video, the stakeholders should be rounded up <laughs> and gotten involved with this because um, otherwise it's not going to be successful. We've worked with schools in the past where you would have one teacher you know, who was very excited about putting in the pollinator garden and they did a nice job, but then when they retire or s switch jobs, then nobody's left to uh, be responsible for it. So assembling the team where you get buy-in from administration, from the maintenance department, you know, oftentimes it takes a lot of education. Why is this a good thing? And what is your involvement going to be? Uh, the teaching staff. Pa if parents can get involved, that's really great too. And community groups and neighbors, the more the merrier. <clears throat> So our first job, uh, once we found out about this grant, which was in January 2017, is to go and assess the site. So that's Andy on the far left and Jack in the center and Holly, our consultant at the time, who was studying GIS and soils and all kinds of great stuff. She was on board to help us. And uh, so they went out to look at this whole schoolyard campus and where was the best site for the garden. And uh, I heard tell that they almost lost Holly in the snow because it was so deep, but uh, she <laughs> climbed her way out. <laughs> Couldn't take any soil samples that day, of course, but uh, at least they got a lay of the land. And the maintenance crew chimed in and said, oh, you, maybe you could do a garden here, garden there. So we had to come up with criteria. Some of the criteria was you know, uh, given to us by the grant uh, folks and uh, and others we learned on our own. So we, you know that you gotta have at least six hours of sun per day in order to support some butterflies and enough plants that are flowering to support them. You should have a water supply nearby to help water the garden until it gets established. Once it gets established, you don't need that water anymore. <clears throat> a spot that's visible, not just to the students, but to the parents that are coming to drop their kids off or to pa passersby and community members that would be an ideal place to um, see that many people will be able to see the garden. And it should be accessible for the students to use for their uh, classes and their assignments. So here's an example of um, you know, one of the spots that was uh, suggested was um, over here and it definitely got a lot of sun, but um, it happens to be a retention pond and it was really sloped. The maintenance crew thought, oh, let's do it there. But we thought, no, that's not gonna work. So um, this area here uh, seemed to be the best. There was already the garden that had been funded by the WPPC was there, although it was a little mangy looking at the time. And this is where the creek goes uh, on the edge. and. So there's a natural area there. You'll see in this, uh, well, I'll show you this footprint first. So this is, the pink area was uh, where the WPPC grant had been uh, allowed them to plant native plants there. This area in green was all lawn. And we chose that to be the garden site. And then this part back here, was a thicket of invasive species, trees and shrubs, and other uh, tangled mess. But, uh, but we, we thought the uh, lawn was the best place to put it. And that's because the existing vegetation really makes a difference in your site assessment. Uh, to know what it's gonna take to get rid of that existing vegetation so you can plant your garden um, is, is an important step. So, Lawn is the easiest, that's what we've found out. If you can strip that lawn up and your garden goes there, that's terrific, especially if the lawn's been chemically treated over the years. That means the soil's beat up, but that means there's not gonna be a lot of weeds. Uh, but this invasive thicket was just full of weeds, but we, it was there, so we just had, knew we had to deal with it. And so this area here was where the garden was gonna go. So we flagged it out 
And uh, we started looking at the plant species that we were going to plant. <clears throat> and the, they should be based on the type of soil you have. We'll show you a soil jar test, very simple way. We found that you really don't have to do very fancy soil tests to figure out what native plants are going to do well. All you have to do is observe uh, what kind, how much organic matter you got and then what kind of drainage you have in the soil. So I'll show you how, how we do that. Uh, the chemical tests, you know, like how much nitrogen and all that stuff, that's kind of irrelevant for native plants. And uh, you just need to know like what kind of drainage in order to choose your plants well. You also should choose the plants based on something blooming spring, summer, fall, the whole growing season, because that's how you're going to support the most pollinators. They need to eat all season long. And then how high you want your plants to grow. <laughs> Nancy and I were talking about this earlier. Well, it says on the tag that it's going to grow for feet. If you have really rich soil, like we got here, or like, it'll be eight feet sometimes. <laughs> In drought years, it might be a little shorter. But, you know, if you really have a type of aesthetic, if your team really wants something that's shorter and, you know, for kindergartners or something, you know, that's not like a jungle, then you could uh, choose your plants accordingly. The the garden here is kind of jungle-like, and the kids really like it, Andy tells us. So it works for this, for this application. And of course, just as a reminder, native pollinators need those native plants. They're specialized relationships. Uh, there are certain bees that only will gather pollen from certain types of native plants to feed their young. And of course, you know the relationship between the monarch butterfly. They will only lay their eggs on milkweeds to rear their young. So the moth and uh, butterfly host plants are often very specific relationships. So native plants overall are just better suited to support the pollinators. And by native, um, we don't mean cultivars of natives either. Many nurseries will sell you you know, echinacea, mellow yellow, or something like that. If it's in a qu quotes, the name of the plant, then that means that it's been cultivated to grow a certain way, look a certain way, have a certain color. It may or may not feed the pollinators well. So stick with the straight natives. And they're more genetically diverse as well. So anything, here's our plant list that we came up with based on the soil type we had and spring through fall uh, blooms. And we wanted to include forbs, or in other words, wildflowers, and grasses and sedges, and shrubs. Shrubs are really nice if you've got enough room to uh, give some structure and definition to the garden. So any questions, thoughts on this part? Yes. Oh, it's usually a lot more. Um, roughly, I'd say 80% forbs, 20% grasses, something like that. But the grasses do help uh, keep weeds from spreading. Their roots are nice and fibrous. They're nice to have in amongst the, the forbs to help stand them up. And they act as nice spacers, you know. So it's really great to have them in. Yeah, Scott. Just in a natural setting, you're going to have a combination of grasses and forbs. So if you don't intentionally put grasses and forbs in, and you just put the flowering plants, the forbs in, uh, grasses are going to come in, and they're not going to be grasses that you want. That's a really but good point. A mixture of uh, grasses and forbs that you want in there, you're taking control and reducing the amount of weeding you're going to have to do. Right. And many grasses support skippers, tiny little butterflies. So any other questions about that? Um, our brochure, if you haven't taken one, uh, on the back table there, has uh, some plant lists for you to begin with. And some um, links to places online where you can go to find plants. So next comes designing the garden. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to spend a little time on paths. 
because we have done lots of experimenting on different types of paths. And we think paths are really important to be able to have access to the garden to get up close and personal, to take a walk through, and for maintenance as well. Um, so our idea at first for this Johnsburg garden was to have a vegetative ground cover um, path. And we thought, let's try path rush. It's already found growing in pads. It can take foot tra traffic. It doesn't grow very tall. It's a pretty tough plant. Uh, so we planted that. And we used that also in two other of the gar school gardens that we've helped with. And with mixed results. Uh, I wouldn't be totally against it, but it didn't work here very well for reasons we'll explain later. Um, but it's, it, it will not be a monoculture in your path. It will be there if it's happy in that spot, but other plants will grow in as well. And you can just deal with that by mowing or weed whacking every once in a while, if that's the kind of path you want. Uh, here's an example of what that kind of path looks like later on. This is a different school where we planted uh, path rush. We hadn't mowed it yet because we wanted the seeds to uh, ripen and fall and fill in. But other things started coming in in between like violets, wild strawberry, which is great. We don't mind that. It looks nice. Another type of path which you might like aesthetically is a paving blocks hardscape. Uh, this is a garden we helped at in Richmond grade school and some parents offered to put in the path and we thought oh terrific but uh, we wouldn't recommend this kind they put these blocks really far apart and these stones in between so a lot of weeds f come up you know even if they put underlayment under there after a couple of years that doesn't keep the weeds out um, also if you're doing this to be accessible to people in wheelchairs or elderly folks, it doesn't really work. It's too bumpy. So, uh, but it looks nice. This is a little better type of a pavement. This is at Westwood School in Woodstock. They had a driveway on the edge of the garden space and they wanted to be able to connect it with enough hardscape to get a wheelchair in there at least part of the way into the garden. They could not um, come up with the funds to pave all the way around, but they've got this walkway here and then another uh, similar one on this side. So uh, they paved this with blocks closer together. Still have to weed it in, the, in between the cracks, but it's not as hard and, and it looks nice. And then uh, another option is just straight mulch, wood chip mulch. This is the Peterson Park Garden uh, that we assisted with, with um, Conversacion de Conservacion and the Youth and Family Center kids planted this two years ago. And we just decided to put a uh, mulch path in and then for the last couple of years it's been just weeded on a regular basis to keep it free of all vegetation and replenished with mulch. Uh, but eventually, who knows, if it starts getting grown over with vegetation, it could just be mown, you know, with a push mower or a weed whacker. Uh, so we'll see how that evolves. <clears throat> and then here's another path that we're experimenting with. This is at our land, uh, Jack and my place. We recently planted a prairie in our backyard and decided to plant the path with echo grass, which is a short growing fescue mix from Prairie Moon Nursery. And so far we like it, it's a few years old. We don't have to mow it very often. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's mowed and it doesn't creep into the rest of the prairie, at least not so far. So, and then also, so besides your paths, you're gonna decide where they go. Oh, we recommend 36 inches wide paths. And uh, then think about the placement. Uh, of course, you'd want to put the short plants in front, tall in back, but short also along path edges and uh, along the whole edge of the garden. <clears throat> and then it's good to, when you're planting, club some of the same individuals of the same species together. You know, at least four of them together, four of them together here, four of them, because it just looks nicer when you have a whole, um, bunch 
of uh, the same species growing together. And it's also easier for the butterflies and bees to find. So think about a sign. If the school wants a sign, the uh, Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation paid for a sign. Nancy Williamson is a graphic artist, so it was a great combination. She was able to uh, design that and work with the sign company. But uh, yeah, work that into where it's a, it's a good fit for uh, the public to see. And then if you want to put some places where the butterflies can hang around and get what they need, that's kind of cool too. Some nice rocks always add interest and that's where butterflies like to bask in the sun. Or, and we um, often include little uh, like dry ponds of gravel and rocks for them to get their minerals from. So here's the completed design. Nothing fancy, I just draw it by hand on graph paper and uh, we included a bunch of different shrubs that we thought were well suited for the site and its soil. Uh, we like chokeberry, it's got flowers in the spring, berries for the birds in the summer and fall. Nine bark is great for butterflies. St. John's wort is always full of bees. Um, and spice bush is nice for the spice, spice bush swallowtail butterfly. And then we just kind of color coded the areas, the yellow areas where the short plants go, red and green where the taller plants go. So, and these are the plants, plant nurseries that we've worked with that we really recommend. I know there's others around too, but these are just the ones that we've gotten good plants from. <clears throat> so before we move on any further, the design part. Got any questions, thoughts, ideas? Yes. Um, what was the, was it plugs versus seed? Oh, yes. Uh, good question. Plugs versus seed. We really recommend plugs. Uh, it takes a lot quicker for it to look nice. It is more expensive, but if you could get a grant, that helps. So did you use all plugs? We used all plugs except for um, around the shrubs we seeded with a, a partridge pea. I'll get into that a little bit later. But yeah, I should have brought in, you'll see the plugs, the same size that we uh, use, we'll have outside, and Jack will uh, show how we plant them. But they're the, you know, the small pots, four inch deep. Yeah, they usually come in 32 to 38 uh, per flat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just add? Sure, um, Nancy. I was administering the grant, and Judy sent this list, as she said, of plants that are, uh, you know, how tall they are, when they bloom, what species they attract, what species uses them. For, for, you know, uh, actually laying their eggs, what type of soils they need, and, you know, a whole chart. And she had like 41 plants. And then uh, we went ahead and ordered, mm -hmm. you know, under, under those instructions, ordered the plants. And then Illinois Clean Energy, mm -hmm. the administrator, sent a list of 12 plants recommended from Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I said, oh, uh, excuse me, we've ordered our plants already. <laughs> and there was no explanation on the plants, no nothing, just a simple list. It's kind of a bare bones. And I said, this is what we did. And I told them about her not, their knowledge with small waters. They called me up and they said, can we use any of these lists for other grant reports? <laughs> I said, absolutely, <laughs> please do. Their knowledge was pivotal in making this garden work. Mm -hmm. But the information is really readily available on sites like Prairie Moon Nursery, um, Possibility Place. They, it's, those are great catalogs for finding you know, what plants fit in these soil conditions, sun conditions for insect use and all that. So it's, it's not hard to find. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, any other questions? Yes. Yes, Scott. Uh, a comment, just, uh, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with that, using plugs uh, in mm -hmm. this type of a situation. Um, you know, once again, we've got people from Township and other applications where you might be doing a larger area of turf to native. Uh, in that case, you probably would want to use seed 
uh, just because it's less expensive uh, and you're, you're not going to get the immediate gratification, uh, but you're able to cover a much larger area at lower cost. And another option is to, if you're going to be covering a large area but have areas that are going to have higher profile views, is you can do the seating over the vast area in those areas that have traffic, uh, you know, if you've got a path or something like that, then you can plant plugs in those areas to get more uh, rapid growth. Uh, so there are a variety of approaches that you can do depending on the size. But if you're doing a, a garden, pollinator garden like this, uh, plugs are definitely the way to go. Yeah, thanks for that. It's, it's important. And a lot of places where you want to see uh, acceptance by the public. Um, seeding is really a lot harder f to get that acceptance right away. So that's why we recommend plugs, even if you're ending up starting with a smaller space. It's better to do it that way. But I, I like your idea of a hybrid, you know, too. You know, yeah, where, on the right, and, and the space you're working you with. There are options if you're covering a larger, larger area. Mm -hmm. Sure, yes? I was curious about the best time to plant. Oh, great question. Best time to plant. Um, we've planted the school gardens usually in May, and uh, that's fine as long as you've got a, somebody to do the maintenance through the summer. And then by fall, when the kids come back from uh, summer break, it's, uh, it's looking like something, and they could use it already. Um, but we also love planting gardens in the fall because it, the plants themselves, it, it'll look a little scrawnier. You know, usually by late summer, you know, the plants in the pots aren't looking as great. Uh, but if, if, you, if that works for you <clears throat> in terms of um, getting people together and getting the help you need to put it in, fall is a great time because then you just like keep it watered until frost and then all winter, you know, it'll be good to go. You don't have to worry about watering it. And then in the spring, it'll already be well established. You might have to water the beginning of that season, but not that much. You just wait and see how long it takes to get established. Yes? The one caveat that I found out with ball planting, particularly with plugs, um, is you want to give four to six weeks before the first frost because they tend to frost heave out of the holes. Oh, yeah. You know, you want uh -huh. four to six weeks of four good to six growing weeks. so they can get some roots into the soil around mm -hmm. the hole. Otherwise, you walk through and they've popped up out of the holes. Did you put mulch on top? Um, the areas that I do are, are pretty large, so uh, you don't. Mulch. Yeah. It's usually there's an erosion control blanket around it. Okay. Not like a material mulch other than the erosion control. Yeah. I think if you had a sizable layer of mulch, it might not heave as much, but that is a concern too, but yeah. Yes? So when they're taking up the sod, mm -hmm. the grassy area, how long do you have to wait before you plant? Um, you could plant really quickly if you wanted, but we found that if there is a gap in between taking up the sod and planting, that's helpful because then you could see what they didn't strip and is gonna sprout again. Then you can go through take out those weeds before you plant. So if you do that in the fall and plant in the spring? If you strip the sod in the fall and then plant in the spring, mm -hmm. yeah, that could work as long as, you know, there's not too much time uh, allowed in the spring for lots of new weeds to pop up. Okay. Right. I, I would say, you know, just try to time it so that you get a couple of weeks in there for whatever roots are left in the ground that didn't get stripped off by the sod cutter to re-sprout and then you go, oh, that was a dandelion there, we'll get that one out. Yeah, yes, Nancy. And Judy, once you catch your sod off, is it good to rototill the whole area or is it better not to disturb all that soil? Do better not, to put your plug in. do not rototill. <laughs> right, uh, that just take, brings up all kinds of trouble for you. Uh, we don't recommend rototilling at all. Even if the soil is really compacted underneath that sod, if that, the landmark school we, in uh, uh, McHenry, they, they got a pollinator garden and they even got t-shirts. And uh, <laughs> that was the last garden we helped put in this spring. And when they took the sod off of that 
soil. Oh my gosh, that was like, it looked so dead. And it was like concrete. And we just knew though from experience that these native plants, once we get them in the ground, they're gonna do their thing and bring that soil to life and they can handle it. They're tough. So it's, it's pretty amazing what they can do. So it's important when you're removing the sod, try to get two inches down. You know, uh, we've had troubles with, you know, people not stripping it deep enough and then you get a whole lot of turf grass coming back. Um, it is, you know, not a super easy job, but you do have to haul away a lot of heavy sod, you know, and have somewhere to put it. But it, compared to um, taking a whole season to try to get rid of lots of other types of vegetation besides turf, <clears throat> that's really the best way to, to go about prepping your site. So I will, you know, just say a few words though about how that weedy thicket of invasive woody species behind the garden had to be dealt with because we knew that would be, we needed that buffer uh, in order to keep all the weed seeds and roots and pr weed pressure from invading the pollinator garden. So we had the crew um, take out uh, the trees and the shrubs that were non-native and invasive and then paint the stumps with herbicide. Um, but we did not deal with the other weeds that were present on site. So you'll see some of them <laughs> out there. We threw some seed out there to try to compete, some native seed, to try to compete with those um, that invasive thicket. And that wasn't too uh, successful. But we're just, you know, managing it as well as we can. And it's, it's pretty interesting back there. We're always discovering cool things. <clears throat> and in case you wanted to make a little butterfly puddling area, this is how we did it. We just dig a shallow hole, line it with pond liner, little scraps of rubber roofing material, um, and fill it with gravel and sand, line it with rocks, and then here I am cutting the excess rubber <clears throat> out. And you could see where, uh, you know, there's a few tufts of grasses that are coming back after the sod was stripped, so that's was a time when we were going around taking those out. And um, soil amendments. Uh, we don't really use them except for mycorrhizal fungi. Does it really help? We don't know. <laughs> the science is not really strong on it. But it's not too expensive. We get a couple bags from Prairie Moon Nursery for, you know, like 30 bucks and sprinkle it on there and say, okay, native plants, if you need some help with mycorrhizal fungi to help your roots, you know, take up nutrients, there it is. So, because uh, we don't know how, how dead the soil is, you know, we don't do the extensive testing. <clears throat> um, and then we spread the mulch on. We just get like two inches of hardwood mulch, spread it around, and it uh, is, that's a heavy job, but we found that kids love doing it. So <laughs> let them do it. <laughs> they have a blast. <laughs> that's at Harrison School in Wonder Lake. <laughs> um, and then we find that in preparation for planting day, it really helps to have everything marked out, you know, so that every, everybody knows where they can walk, where the plants go. So we spend a lot of time doing the prep work. We mark out the paths with uh, clothesline and staples and uh, where the, the shrubs are gonna be planted. We, we put a, a rope circle where it's gonna be like the mature width, right? And then uh, where the plants go, we place a little tag and Jack will show you that uh, demonstration how we do that. And one foot apart, one foot centers. Pretty close spacing, but it really works. So that's where uh, having some Trusty, hardy volunteers helps a lot. So before planting day, that's what the garden looked like. All those tags <laughs> ready to go. There was about 800 tags out there. And we planted 800 plants all in one day. And it was a lot of organization. We had a lot of uh, help from uh, volunteers. We had to train the volunteers what to do. And uh, 
you know, organize all the teams because we have a new class coming in, you know, like every 40 minutes or so. And uh, <clears throat> it was a blast. And we had some education as part of it so the kids knew why they were doing this. And they all had a lot of fun. We had gloves available. Most of the kids didn't even want to wear gloves. They wanted to get their hands muddy and uh, slush around in the water and play with the, with the worms. It was a blast. It really was. That's, that's like our favorite day is planting day. <laughs> Except Nancy was sore after that, right? <laughs> yeah. And then um, actually we planted the shrubs first here at Johnsburg uh, before planting day, but we recommend actually waiting till after all the forbs and grasses are planted by the kids and then adults can come back later and, and plant the shrubs because those spaces where we left to open where the shrubs are going to go that's good places for you know walking around and maneuvering and all that so uh, that's nancy planting and a uh, uh, ex uh, student from johnsburg junior high he came back to help out and then around the spaces around the baby shrubs you know until they grow to mature size, it's gonna be a couple years. So this is the only place we put seed. And we recommend either partridge pea or another thing that would work well is um, Rudbeckia hirta, black-eyed Susan. Um, <clears throat> because these will diminish as the uh, shrubs grow, but they'll reseed themselves. And the bees love them. So it, they grow like a partridge pea grows a foot high. It's good stuff. And then now uh, our lovely, wonderful um, interns that summer helped us plant the path rush in the path. But because the soil was so rich and the plants grew so tall, they shaded out the path rush. <laughs> path rush needs sun. So it didn't work here at Jansburg, but it survived at other places. So let's go back to the planting part uh any more questions about planting yes so if you're doing seeds you still put mulch also or is mulch only if you're putting plants? um we were able to p sow the partridge pea seeds right on top of the mulch and then just rake it in a little bit so that that worked for for that those seeds that might not work for every seed um if you're doing seeding this that's a whole different process so that you would have to consult, you know, somebody who um, is more, and we have done some uh, seeding of, of native areas, um, but it's gonna look different. It's not gonna be as designed, because, you know, the seeds are all mixed together. So, you know, you're not gonna have short in the front and tall in the back. You, you could kind of separate some of your seeds if you wanted to, but, but it is a different process, yeah. So, yes. I would point out, oh, though, Jack. One seed, you have to be prepared to wait a long time. Some of these plants will bloom many years later, mm -hmm. if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And so in the meantime, you'll have weed pressure from your non-natives to deal with. Yes, so seeds. Thing, you know, if you're going to do a prairie restoration, we do this though with the prairie restoration, oak savanna restoration, things like that, where we do seeding. And not a problem, but we're doing a garden here. Mm -hmm. We want to be accepted by the homeowners associations and neighbors and things like that. Yes. So, you had a question? Yes, and one thing about seeding, if you're doing a large area, if you're looking for a middle ground in between, like, expense-wise, like seed and plugs, mm -hmm. if you have access or, or know a company with a drill seeder, like a native plant drill seeder, mm -hmm. that sometimes a little bit more expensive, but really gives the seeds kind of a boost, especially if you're doing like a large turf to prairie, because it's cheaper than plugging it would be, um, but sometimes expedites the process a little bit, um, as opposed to just overseeding or something on top. So drill seeding, you found works yeah. faster, yeah, the, so the plants get better like established. A, yeah, like a native, so there's some that are better for like native seed mixes and stuff mm -hmm. like that, then sometimes it, it expedites the process a little bit from what we found and you'll get mm. more bloom time. Instead of three years, maybe there's more in the first year. You'll get more seed sprouting in yeah, the first it's year. it's more expensive than just like, it's like the middle ground. Okay. Is what I found. 
That's um, cool. But my question was, have you ever used uh, leaf compost instead of mulch at any of your sites? Instead of wood mulch? Yeah, so no, we haven't. Yes, we did. When did we use leaf compost? When we worked with the uh, I don't remember that. Blue Lotus Buddhist Temple, we gave them site and Greg Rice, we brought in. Oh, okay. There I forgot that. And disadvantage yeah. to that, we believe it can be very good in what we see. But Mm -hmm. Yeah, the wood the wood mulch just pretty much breaks down in in about a year anyway, and then we don't replenish it. Yeah, yeah, Nancy. You mentioned the so you introduced me to soil knives. Oh yeah, we'll sh we'll we'll cover that outside. We'll show you all our favorite tools. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so and Scott, yes. Yeah, as far as compost go, just be very careful. Uh, a lot of the compost that's used uh, sits there for years, growing weeds on top of it, and uh, can be a major weed source. That happened at, uh, uh -huh. at the county demonstration gardens that I've got. The, the contractor thought he was doing us a favor and brought in uh, compost to amend the soil. <coughs> and uh, I, I caught them as they were doing it. And the area that got the compost before I stopped them, I've been fighting weeds for seven years now. Uh, the area yes. that, uh, I stopped them, uh, I, we had a little weeds to begin with but, uh, um, because of soil disturbance, but uh, night and day difference. So just be careful if you're going to use compost. Make sure you're getting it from somebody who hasn't uh, let it sit there or getting, uh, developing a seed bank of weed seeds. Yeah, Even compost. Especially now of like just shredded leaf. Leaf Shredded compost. leaf compost yeah. is the best. Don't just use leaf <laughs> compost for your backyard. Yeah. Well, and even depending on where you get your shredded wood, yeah. your wood chip yeah. mulch. Uh, one garden, uh, the it was really freshly shredded up, and there was all these tree seeds in there. So we've been fighting that for yeah. years at that garden. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Okay. So let's go on to. Uh, the maintenance part, and then after this, we'll be going outside. Um, so it's really important to make sure that those plants are watered until they're established, uh, and check for the ones that weren't planted correctly. You know, because some kids try hard, but they don't quite get it deep enough or too deep or whatever. So you have to watch the ones that aren't looking so good, and sometimes replant them, uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, a good deep watering, you know, to really check that soil on a regular basis the first growing season by sticking that soil knife in there and moving the mulch away and how far does the moisture go into the ground and make sure that the water really gets to the root zone. Uh, putting just a lawn sprinkler out there might not do it unless you leave it out overnight, you know. Um, so. Watering, got to really keep on that. And also the first year, there is space between those uh, plants that you planted. And so keeping the weeds out of there the first year is going to go a long way for making it uh, get established and less competition and letting those plants fill in. And even if you do miss some of those weeds on the interior of the garden and they grow, we found that if you keep your um, priorities on the edges and keep those edges nice and trim and keep a nice you know, foot or 18 inches of bare mulch on the outside edge, that says to everybody that this is taken care of. <laughs> and that message is really important. <clears throat> and it looks good. You know, so people won't even notice, you know, a thistle back there, you know, here or there, or a dandelion, if that edge is kept nice and neat. And so you'll have to keep uh, adding mulch every year to that border, or your paths, if you're keeping mulch on the paths. But other than that, uh, no more mulching is needed on the inside of the garden. And in fact, that's not really good for the pollinators to have lots of wood chips on the ground. They need some bare patches. Uh, so we'll talk maybe more a little bit outside too about the habitat needs for the uh, native bees and uh, ground nesting bees especially. So uh, yeah, so this is the difference in uh, just a few months. This is, at, yeah, in the fall, this is what it looked like. Uh, so it, it filled in pretty fast. And of course, 
goes without saying, don't use insecticides. You don't want to kill <laughs> the little critters that you're trying to help. Uh, but, you know, some maintenance crews, that's automatic. So you got to make sure that they get the memo. Don't use insecticides. If they can keep herbicides away from even the lawn adjacent to the garden, that's nice. Uh, if not, you know, really pr impress upon them that drift is an issue because we've had sections of garden that we've taken care of killed by drift, even when the guys, uh, the maintenance guys have really tried. <clears throat> and then the other thing that's different about native gardens is you don't clean up everything in the fall and take it away. You leave it there because those are your pollinators. They are eggs, larvae, pupa, adults. They're all over wintering except for the ones that migrate. So you don't cut down those stalks and they are food for birds. There's seeds. There's all kinds of life happening all through the winter. And then in the spring, this is a fun thing to do with kids. They come out around Earth Day and uh, we ask them to, the standing stalks, you just break them around knee high, you let them lay. And so you lay down uh, the stalks that are standing so it looks nice and neat and mulch, but you still have one standing up. And then pretty soon, the little tiny bees are gonna show up and start laying their eggs in these stalks. And uh, it's just wonderful to watch. <coughs> And then pretty soon, I mean, those standing stalks, you're going to see them for a couple weeks, and then you don't see them anymore because the plants are growing. Um, and here's a plug for our community, uh, pollinator-friendly community action team. Yay, Linda, yay, <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> we are, uh, Small Waters has been trying to gather up interested folks who want to help out at these various gardens that we've helped to plant because especially schools that are not around in the, uh, in session in the summer, uh, they need help with maintaining. And that's the time when everything's growing. So uh, folks who, from the neighborhood who are interested in learning to ID native plants, who want to grow some in their own yards, who want to learn more about best practices, and who want to take home the little seedlings that are growing in the wrong place or some seeds that they can collect in the fall and then use them for their own gardens. That's our action team, and we would love for you to take a flyer home and let us know, email us if you want to be on the team and learn more, And uh, because we think that this is the wave of the future, the communities taking care of the landscapes. So here's a couple of the visitors that have been seen at Johnsburg School Pollinator Garden, these wonderful bumblebees and tree frogs, and you should see the kids when they dis discover these critters. Oh my gosh. They just go nuts. So if you want to visit any of these other schools that we've helped install gardens at, uh, please feel free. Uh, they're all different. They all have different looks, different designs based on the site, diff different plant regimes. And so it's a good way to see how it could look in your setting. And we are available for any questions and consultations and ideas for you. And uh, yeah, as I said, the Peterson Park and the Garden Quarter Apartments Gardens were uh, a project that uh, was the coalition of environmental <laughs> groups in the county known as Conversacion de Conservacion, working with the children from the Youth and Family Center uh, summer pro camp program. So that was really fun. This is the Peterson Park Garden, by the way. So. I would like to leave with a question. If we want to talk about it now, we could. Otherwise, we could just head out to the garden. But this is what we got to ask ourselves. What will help us transform our landscapes into healthy ecosystems? What are all the things that need happening? And what can you do? I've, I've had some, like they're really nice because they come cut plant because they hold water. So the goldfinches love them. We just laid black plastic down for a whole okay. season. Okay. Okay. Down. <laughs> and killed it. I, I tried this first in our yard and it worked. I've never heard of this before. Uh, I've never seen a nine mark that big. We like to I know we're going to show the others later on if you want to see. But no, we were doing it against the fence. They're going off there. That's a sunflower. That's a sunshine. Close that we planted. Okay.
so it's pretty happy here. This is your part. <laughs> the jar <laughs> test. Come on, Judy. You're on. Come on. Get with okay. Judy's going to explain how to test your soil so you know what type of plants to order, whether you're going to order ones that uh, go in a wetter condition, clay or soil or sandy. Right. This is basically just how to test for particle size. So just dig with a good shovel down a, as far as you can go, like at least a foot or two feet down. If, uh, if you could get deeper, that's great. Um, and then fill your jar like two thirds with soil. Try to keep out any critters and you know big leaves and stuff, <laughs> and they're gonna die. Yeah. And then you fill the rest up with water and shake it up and let it sit for a couple of days. And then it'll settle out with the bigger particles, the sand at the bottom, the silt in the middle, and the clay on top. If you're uh, Water is still sh uh, cloudy, you know, after you shake it up for a day or so, that means you've got still some clay particles floating around in there and, and you let them settle. Um, I'll pass this around and then you could see, if you just look really close, um, you, you could see the difference in where the particle size changes. So then you could kind of get an idea of, oh, is it 50% sand, 50% silt and you know usually we see very little clay but if there's a lot of silt the smaller particles in your jar then it's still going to mean that the, the um, soil doesn't drain really fast and it might be harder to dig uh, so that will just help you to um, decide what kind of plants to order right Th does that make sense yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Right. So the the plants that like sandy, well-drained soil, you know, if you've got a lot of sand in your in your jar, then then you know those are the kind to get. Okay, uh, Alicia. Very quickly, let's give a demonstration. Half the people saw it and half didn't. Show how this tool works. Oh yeah, see she 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 loves this tool, right? <laughs> okay. There's not many weeds to pick from. This is a hoe. It's got it. It came from Earthworks. It's a it's a energy saver. You go over the edges uh, about once a month or so, and uh, you just shave. It just shaves your uh, annual weeds. Look how quick she is. Okay, it works. You know. Before it would take us four or five times as long. The other one I'm going to show you is this. That's available on mail order from Earthworks in Kentucky. This one is a Weasel Edger, Ace Hardware, thirty-nine dollars, right here in uh, Johnsburg, uh, Crystal Lake. And the way that this works is, once you want to establish your edge, you step in the middle like that. Look, it goes all the way down. There's a stop. You can't go too deep. And you push it all the way down here, and then this comes up. Mm -hmm. You shake off your dirt and throw your grasses away. And that keeps your edge neat. Yeah, and you go down the whole list <clears throat> all the way. Okay, I just wanted to show you that, but now I'm going to show you the good stuff, okay? Come all the way here. What we did was I cut it down so it's even, and then I watered it heavily already before I watered it. See? Water. I watered it really heavily and the way you check whether you water it heavily enough is this is your soil knife. This is a very handy thing to have. This particular brand has inch marks on it which is can be important to you. But stick it down two inches I think I did more, and I put my finger in there, and then you pull the dirt out. If it feels moist, you're okay, okay? People water, they're sprinkling all day on their lawn. Oh, I did a good job, you know. It may not have penetrated, you don't know. It's the roots that count. The leaves don't need the water, it's the roots that need the water. 
the nice thing about uh, where do my plants go? Oh, they're in the car. <laughs> Why did you put them in the car? I put them out here. Oh, you put them out here. No, they're back there. I see them. Here. Ah! Yeah, I thought they planted themselves already. <laughs> but this is what I want to show you, the nice thing about this. That's what we all need. These are the size plugs we were talking about. Do you recognize these? Yeah. The soil knife is made for this. This width matches the width of the soil knife. Four inch mark here, that's the depth you want. You don't want to do more work than you have to. If you dig a hole that's really bigger, then you have to make sure you put soil back so you don't have air pockets and then you water it and water it the heck out of it. You can't drown it, but that'll close air pockets. Right, so we just encourage people only dig the hole big enough to put that plug in. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. So here, this, is, this happens to be already pretty slopey. So Are you now, sure you're going to plant into here? This yeah. is the lawn. Well, I'm putting this here and I'll plant further down. Here. I don't care about the lawn. Well, <laughs> the maintenance. How many care about that? On? Okay, yeah, I can back it down. Yeah, because you got your, you got your flags. Here. We're going to start here anyway. I'm going to allow for a border. Okay, don't forget to take the plastic tape off. I thought I did. Yeah, if you find cardboard and it's got plastic tape on it, take it off. Oh, yeah, see, I already established my flags there. Uh -huh. I didn't even see that. I'm just putting in a staple because this is so sloped. This is just to hold it temporarily. The, where you have invasives, you want to put cardboard on there, or if you don't have cardboard, newspapers about 10 layers, okay? Then you take this and you soak it in. Can I have a volunteer who knows how to water? <laughs> who wants to learn how to water? <laughs> Come on, don't be shy, all right. <laughs> I'm worried that I'm All right, really soak rich. that in, soak that in really good. Then I'm going to ask for volunteers to help plant. Go all the way across. Okay. We'll try to have it make make the whole thing moist all the way. Sometimes what I do is after you water one side, you flip it over and water the other side. Yeah, I sort of pre-watered this already so it's still a little wet on the inside. Okay, and then what we do is we'll put mulch on there. Now, I actually went to Menards to buy this mulch because our mulch is infested with ants. And when I started digging, the ants crawled up. When I noticed it, I was all covered with ants, so I was running around, you know, where the sun don't shine, you know. <laughs> I was stripping down. And, it was nasty. So give me a knife there. Volunteer to help spread. Help spread the mulch. Come on, guys. Another volunteer. This is not entertainment, folks. You're going to learn to work here. All right. Alicia knows how to work already. Just spread the mulch. Yeah. Right. About two inches. You can use your hand. Doesn't hurt. Yeah, that's pretty good. And then you're going to water it in some more. No, you don't need to water the mulch. Well, we can water it later. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next. Now, the next thing we'll do is lay it out. I'm showing you a layout for a larger garden. If you're only planting a couple of plants, you know, you don't need it. This is a this is a little gadget I made. It's a spacer. It, it's one foot, one foot, and the way it works. Just because I invented it, I'm proud of it. Okay, but what it is is you'll get your plant spacing right. When you're doing 800 plants, your plant spacing is important because once you start here, you get to the end there. You'll be all over the place. So 
see, fits right there. That's one, 12 inches spacing and then 12 inches spacing on that. You got it? You got it? If you don't got it, let me know. Okay, so we'll go from the border here. We'll just say, we'll stick one in maybe here. We might need to water in a little more because this this is drying up quickly, the cardboard. This is how you do it. And then this is just an example like how you would go along. So this is how we mark the tags for the, to prepare for planting day. Yeah. So that it goes quick. And, and these tags are, uh, we just got them off of Amazon, and they're kind of flexible, so even if a kid steps on them, they're not about to break. Or they, cost, they cost $10 for about a thousand of them. We tried popsicle sticks, not good. We tried Venetian white, somebody tried, and we painted some different colors, you know. So, and a pinch, you use what you got. I, I only, we only, we bought four plants here. So, uh, Okay, uh, I want I want some volunteer. Okay, I'll tell you what. Maybe I should spread it out here so you can get people working more. Okay, I'll put another one in on the far side here. So, did you want to have a few people that plant um, at the same time that you're planting? Yeah, or maybe I don't even need to plant. Uh -huh. Are you, or do you want to demonstrate first and then have? Sure. Somebody okay, else? this is. What I'm gonna do, if you come in a little closer, you can see something, all right? Okay, uh, I'm gonna do the center one. I'm gonna clear out where I put the mulch. Now, if you're doing a lawn removal of sod, you don't need the cardboard, you know? Cardboard. If you strip the, the sod off, in other words, we. We don't use cardboard. We, you didn't see that in our slides. Mm -hmm. um, but in this application, since the sod was not stripped and there's plants underneath that are still going to sprout back, this cardboard method will suppress them long enough to give a leg up to the native plants that you're planting. They're still going to come back, the weeds, but it, it won't be as strong and as quick. So, okay. Just an easier way. So. Soil knife. I'll show you. Can you get the drill too? I want to show oh, that. Okay. We like the soil knife. It works for most of the time really well. You go one, four inches down, wiggle it, go next to it. You make like a square too, four inches down, and then four inches down. And then you can scoop it out like that. Oh, look, I got a root here. Yeah, you're going to find stuff. In, in okay, now I'm going to flatten the bottom a little bit. I don't want to air pocket in the bottom where the tap root hits. Then this is a lovely plant. Which one is this one? That's Rebecca Fulgida, showy, black eyed Susan. Okay. I got some sprouts over here. I don't know what those are. Is the same, same thing? thing. Same thing. Okay. If you get a big root on the bottom, you can take your fingers and pinch it off. Then you wiggle the side like this, okay? It comes out easy. You push it down. Yeah. See how that went? The surface See? of the, where the plant is growing in the pot needs to match the surface of your soil. Mm -hmm. right, right underneath the cardboard. If okay. it's sticking up this this high, it's not going to survive. Right. If it's w really deep, it's not going to survive. And if it comes out like this, then you don't have the air pockets to worry about. Your planting will be successful. In school gardens, when we do planting there, uh, sometimes with kids or even with adults, they'll start planting it wrong or revert to a method of planting when they're planting petunias at home. You're not planting petunias. This is different. Then you just water it in really, really good. Really, really good. 
Isn't that nice? It's really, really good, really, really good. Now, then you take your mulch, you tuck it in like a baby. Who ever tucked a baby in? <laughs> ever tuck a baby in? All right, then you water it some more. Do you see how that easy that was? And if your soil is super duper compacted and you have kindergartners who are really like struggling to dig that hole, you could give them a, a, a little bit of a help by getting a bulb auger at Menards. They're not very expensive, but you need a high power drill. You know. This one's good enough for rechargeable. Mm -hmm. And what you can do, Scott, where are you at, Scott? He used one there with limited success, but he had webbing on the ground which had to be cut. Mm -hmm. So I've never really tried it going through cardboard. Let's see what happens. It got, whoop, can you get it out? It got full of mulch. <laughs> yeah, I should have removed the mulch. Yeah. I've never done this though. I usually use it just on the regular dirt, see? It goes fast, but it makes too big of a hole that you want to fill it in really good. But it does work, especially on hard ground where you have limited energy. Would anybody like to try a hands-on? Uh, Three people. If, if, if you're the kind of person who learns by doing, here's your chance. <laughs> We have three more, three more plants that you'd like to plant. Don't you want to try? You can do one. You can do one. Oh, there we go. Well, you already know how. Okay, you want to try? Who, who has never done this before? This is your lucky day. You can't make a mistake. We did um, Peterson Park. Yes. Yeah. We did this with kids. Okay. You can pull out the plastic now. I think so. Yeah. Four inches. Yeah, because we were suspicious of the... Sleep. Okay, everybody who's shy, just watch her, see? She's brave, brave. <laughs> Americans are brave. We're planting native plants, American plants, m native to McHenry County, not from anywhere in the world. When you plant these, you'll know where you are. You're in McHenry County. And you take out, take out your wood chip and tuck in the bottom a little bit and then test it now. Take it out. Take it, take it apart. Yeah, take the plastic off. We've got people plant it. Uh, no. Did you see me? When, the, when it was on, you turn it upside down. You pinch off the root and pull it off. Okay. There's less damage to the side. Before you take the... Okay. It out of the pot? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good height, see? She got her right away. Yeah, and then she's she's already proficient in watering. Watch her watch her do this. Stuff. You don't think there's any big pockets in there? No, yeah, there might pockets. be. Press it down a little bit. Because <laughs> you have a little bit of soil left over. If you're not sure, you could always... That's right. If there's a little soil, you can tuck it in. It'll settle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody how much fun this was. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, here, it was fun. Okay.